We're going to talk today a little bit about PubMed. I'll give you a quick overview. Um, I'll talk about some tips for finding on-topic articles. Uh, oh, sorry. I will show you two strategies um, for searching. The first one is uh, what we call kind of a quick and dirty search. So there are some things you can do if you just need a handful of articles. And I will show you how to do that. And then there is the more systematic approach when you need a more robust search. Um, so for those who said they were interested in finding um, evidence for patient care, the first search would be a really good way to do it. And also, even if you're doing a more robust search, I would say start with this kind of quick and dirty search to see what's out there before you really start developing that um, systematic approach. So both of these approaches are going to be very useful. And then at the end, I will show you how to um, set up some alerts and save your results. You can even send them to a citation manager like um, RefWorks or EndNote, any of those. And um, I'll also stay on um, to answer any questions that people have. So, so that's what we're doing. Okay. So PubMed um, is produced through the National Library of Medicine. And the reason I always bring that up is because PubMed is free. Anybody can access it as long as you have internet. Um, and uh, that is wonderful. But one of the things you have to keep in mind is if you want to access the journal articles um, and the resources that Hopkins is paying big money for you to be able to access, you have to go to the library website to get into PubMed. And I'll show that in just a minute. Um, so go to our website, access PubMed that way, and that way you'll be able to get the full text of those articles. Although more and more articles are becoming um, open access and available through PubMed, which is great news for those who aren't um, affiliated with a university. It is one of the largest um, biomedical databases. Uh, the number, it's just like the McDonald's sign. The number keeps changing. So now we're at 30 million citations. I have to update my slide. Um, and it provides access to many things, but one of the things it provides access to is Medline. So I have seen a lot of confusion here with the word Medline and the word PubMed. They do not mean the same thing. Medline actually is content, it's most of the content of PubMed, but you can access Medline um, through other databases. You can access it through something called EBSCOhost, um, you can access it through ProQuest, through Ovid. Um, so Medline is those journal articles that you're trying to get your hands on. And PubMed is the way that you access it. It's the shell or the database that we're using to get our hands onto Medline. So PubMed provides you with those citations from Medline, but it also gives you other things. Um, there are some books that PubMed's providing you with. It's also providing you with access to newer things, newer articles that haven't been um, indexed in Medline as yet, and also older articles, what we call old PubMed, um, that also you wouldn't normally find in Medline. Um, so if you're used to using Medline through a different database, uh, I've noticed in a lot of systematic reviews, um, teams are switching over to PubMed because they are finding that they are um, finding more resources through PubMed that they might miss out on if they use Medline in a different um, capacity, a different way. And so the last thing to know about um, our Medline, our PubMed that we're searching, is that it uses a controlled vocabulary. Um, so for those people who uh, are like, why do I need PubMed? I can just use Google Scholar, it's got everything. Um, it probably does have a lot of things, but it doesn't have this control vocabulary operating behind the scenes to really help you search efficiently and effectively. And we'll talk more about that in this course, how that control vocabulary can help you. Okay, so for this course, we'll do two questions. Um, one, uh, we'll do just to show you how to do the quick and dirty search. Um, and the other question um, I'll use to show you the more systematic um, search that you would do in a comprehensive, uh, comprehensive search. I'm going to 
end this poll. Sorry, let me just close that. Okay. So our first question is, what is the risk of opioid misuse among those with chronic pain? Um, I have been involved in a lot of research. There are a lot of teams out at Hopkins that are focused on the opioid crisis. Um, and so this would be more of a search that we'll do if you just want a few really high quality pieces of evidence on this question. And then the second question, um, I know there's a lot of interest right now with COVID and the fact that um, people are not coming in to get health uh, care, but uh, there's a lot of remote help. Um, so this question is what apps are being used to help those with hypertension eat more healthy diets? Um, and perhaps you're thinking of developing an app and you wanna see what others have done. So those are our two questions. Okay, so let me go into PubMed. And again, as I said, you want to get into it through the Welch Library website. So here's our website, uh, welch.jhmi.edu. And here's PubMed right here. Now you might have noticed if you have used PubMed before that this is a completely new look. Uh, they launched it, they threatened to launch it um, for months and months, but I think last month it actually became live. It's the main, um, the main PubMed that you're gonna search. If you are like, I just can't handle this right now, I want my old PubMed. If you go back to our website, we have a link here for PubMed Legacy and that will get you to the old PubMed. But I'm gonna um, show everything in new PubMed so that you get used to using it, um, seeing it and how to use it. Okay, so for our question about opioid misuse and chronic pain, the nice thing about PubMed is we can just type it in. I can type in my words, opioid misuse, chronic pain, spell everything right, hit go. Okay, and I'm not getting a huge number of results, but a lot of times in PubMed, you do your search and you're getting 10,000 results. If I were to search cancer, I believe it's in the millions of results. So there are some things you can do to your search. Just, it'll take you five seconds and it will help immensely. The first one is, if you have, and let me make this a little bigger. Let's see if that helps. Okay, if you have phrases, opioid misuse, put them in quotes. And this, what this is gonna do is it's gonna tell PubMed to search for that phrase and not break it up. Otherwise, it's just looking for that word opioid and the word misuse. It's splitting them up, it's doing all kinds of crazy things. But if you keep it in quotes, it knows that we want this specific phrase. And you might notice I put an and in between those two terms. By default, PubMed is assuming that you want an and in there. It's just adding it in there and you don't even notice. Um, but I'm gonna type it in there and I'm gonna type it in all caps. Um, yes, capitalization does matter. I had a search go completely off last week and I couldn't figure out what was going on and I asked a colleague and they looked at it and they're like, you're not using caps for your Boolean operators. So you need to do caps. Okay. So we do it in quotes. It already drops down the number and the results are gonna to start to look a little bit better. Now, one more thing I'm gonna do, and this here, this is the trick. If you just want a few really high quality on topic articles, the first thing I do is I do this bracket TI close bracket. I'm gonna do it on both of them, bracket close up, uh, Sorry, bracket, T-I, close bracket. Anyone wanna guess what that does? You can just type it in the um, chat box. So what happens when I use a T-I at the end of my phrase? Yeah, Christy got it right away, title. T-I stands for title, and I'm saying I just want those terms in the title. Uh, again, when I'm just getting started on a topic, this is a quick way to do it. I'm already down to 63 results. I know they're gonna be on topic because they're talking about chronic pain and opioid misuse. And I can start to scroll through these and look at them. 
Now that might feel too restrictive. You might be like, oh, well, wait a minute. I know that people publish articles and they're not using that word. They're not using the right terms. So I can make it a little bit bigger. I can do TIAB. Anyone want to guess what that does? So TI was title. What do you think TIAB does? Yep, yes, yes, you got it. Abstract, title and abstract. Um, and right now I'm not viewing my abstracts, but I like, oh, well, maybe I am. I always like to switch to abstract view. And that way I can scroll through and I can just read the abstract. Keep on going, read the abstract. That way I don't have to click as much. I can just look at everything all at once. Um, and what you'll start to notice is that the articles are coming up because opioid misuse, chronic pain are in the title and abstract. Let me go back to summary view. Okay, so two, two steps you can do. All of a sudden your search is gonna be much more on topic. Um, if you want those high quality articles, the other thing I would suggest is to limit by the type of articles you're looking at. So um, here we go. On the left, there's all kinds of ways to filter. And I'm gonna go to article type. And I can choose systematic review. And if you're gonna do a systematic review of your own, the first thing I would recommend doing is go into PubMed and see if somebody else has published a systematic review on your topic and how current is that systematic review because I don't want you to go and put 18 months of work into doing a systematic review and then you try to publish it and the journals say mm, no this has already been done um, and it's it's recent we don't need another systematic review on this topic so it's a really good idea um, all around to limit to systematic reviews and see what else has been out there. Um, here we have even more of a review. We have a review of reviews. So there you go. Um, look at these articles. They're gonna give you ideas about terminology that you can be using. Um, they're going to give you ideas about articles that you should try to find. Um, and they're gonna give you some really high quality evidence. Now another, uh, limit you can put on here is randomized controlled trials. So if we just start out looking at randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews of our topic, we limit to TIAB and we put our phrase, phrases and quotes right there. Those are the steps that I would say are going to get you uh, a really nice set of articles. Okay, um, I'm looking at a question from Jonathan. Um, do you just learn the best flow, start broad, then go to title, then go to title abstract, trial and error experience, um, what's best? Um, it really depends on your goals. And so as, I'm say, as I've been saying, like when you're starting out, I usually, if your goal is to just get started, get your feet wet in the topic, see what's out there, I start with this TI. But the reason that there are all, are all these options is this is more of an art than a science. I know you want like a lockstep, first do this, then do that, do that, then do this, but that you have these options and that's why there's all these tools out there. Um, I would start with the TI, look at those 10 results, see how they're doing, um, and also look for some other terms that you can use. And then you can broaden it up to TIAB and you'll get a few more articles. So I start small and then I broaden, but really it's a preference. Some people are super comfortable looking through 10,000 results. They don't bat an eye. Um, so they don't like this approach of starting small. They wanna start big and then get smaller. It's really um, what you're comfortable with. If we wanted to make this a little bit bigger, I would start adding some synonyms. So opioid misuse, Notice I put in um, a parenthesis and I'm going to say or opioid abuse. Again, I'm keeping that TIAB, close parenthesis. 
Now you can add as many synonyms as you want. There's several other ways to refer to opioid misuse, right? We could do opioid dependence, um, opioid addiction. We could keep going, but you're always going to use an or because we're telling PubMed this term or that term are good, either one. And then you have to put it in parentheses because that is keeping them together and that way PubMed doesn't get confused. If you don't have these parentheses, PubMed doesn't know, are you saying opioid misuse or opioid abuse and chronic? It just doesn't know what's going on. So you keep your or terms in parentheses and then you hit search. And every or term you add in, it makes it a little bit bigger. Okay. Um, so that is my quick and dirty. In five, you know, five minutes, that's what I would do just to get started on your search to find a few high quality articles. Um, the new PubMed also has a nice uh, publication date limit. We can do one year, five years, 10 years. Um, I was noticing that it was doing like last month, but that seems to be missing right now. Um, so we can do the last year. And again, we're looking at the most current. Another thing to note is that this best match, you see how it says sorted by best match. PubMed is using an algorithm behind the scenes. Um, it's an extremely complicated algorithm and there's a video I'll point you to um, that we just made at the Welch Library that you can watch if you wanna know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, but PubMed is trying to put the best articles, the most relevant articles at the top. And then as you scroll down, they'll go, they'll go from most to least relevant. Um, and so that is the best match. It's not always perfect, but I've been noticing it's pretty good. If you're like, I don't want PubMed to tell me what it thinks is relevant. I want to have control. <clears throat> you can switch from best match to most recent or publication date. So when I'm, um, when I'm searching, I want to have control. I, I don't, you know, PubMed is great. It's very helpful, but I want to be able to see the very most recent articles at the top and I'll decide if it's relevant or not. So I usually switch that to publication date. And then we can scroll down and you'll see that they're going to get older and older. Okay, so that's the quick and dirty search. Um, does anyone have any questions about that approach? Ah, uh, what's the difference between publication date and most recent? I'm glad you asked because I had no idea and then I looked it up. So publication date is the actual date that um, the article was published. Most recent is when it was added into PubMed. <clears throat> So um, publication date is what you would want to sort by if you want to look at the newest article to oldest article. Make sense? Okay, any other questions before we move on? Okay, great, fantastic. Uh, let me get my PowerPoint back up. Okay. So like I said, you can just throw some terms in the search box, but you are at PubMed Search Like a Pro, so we are gonna get a little more sophisticated than that. And for this finding a few on-topic results, I would recommend these field tags for sure. And then using the filters, the publication types, the years, you can limit by English as well. Okay, so now moving on to a more sophisticated way, way to search, that involves using control vocabulary. Um, how many of you have heard of this term mesh? Is this a new phrase for y'all? You can just put in the search box if, if you feel comfortable with mesh or you've heard what mesh is. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, okay, great. Not um, not familiar. There's some people where this is new. Okay, so I will um, give you the lowdown. So like I said, there's this controlled vocabulary happening behind the scenes in PubMed. Um, and I'm going to use those words synonymously, mesh and controlled vocabulary. 
Um, many databases have a controlled vocabulary that they use to index their articles, but in Medline or in PubMed, we call it MeSH. Um, and let me talk about why it exists or why controlled vocabulary exists. So let's consider that these are all the articles on a topic. Um, perhaps we are searching for articles on the ICU. Now there's a problem because, you know, I might be thinking in my head ICU, but that doesn't mean that's what the authors are using. They might not be using that phrase. They might be thinking of other terms. So if I just search for ICU, I'm going to miss out on a lot of articles, right? So if I just search for ICU, I'm getting, you know, with my little visual diagram here, I'm getting four of the articles, but it looks like, oh my gosh, a lot of authors are actually talking about intensive care and they're not using this ICU. So I'm going to miss out on all those articles. I'm going to miss out on any articles where authors talk about NICU or PICU. Um, and it goes on from there. So if we were just searching with these terms and hoping that articles come up, then what that means is we have to be really thorough about thinking about every possible term an author might use. And that's exhausting, it takes a lot of time. So what has happened is these databases have developed controlled vocabulary um, and they index all the articles. There are actual people who read all the articles in Medline and when they index it, they tag it with a standardized term um, so the official term here for ICU is intensive care unit. Any article that has to do with this concept is going to be tagged with that mesh. And so when we search with that mesh, all the articles will come up that have been tagged with it, regardless of how the authors refer to that term. So if an author refers to it as an ICU, doesn't matter. It's gonna, if it has that mesh and we search by it, we're gonna get the article. So um, using mesh saves us time. It's more efficient. It's gonna pull up articles um, that we might not have even thought of to look for. So that's mesh in a nutshell. Um, did that make sense to the people who are like, I've never heard of mesh or mesh is kind of new to me? I'll show you how it works when we go into the database, but that's the basic ideas. Great, excellent. Okay, um, so mesh is wonderful. I've just said, you know, it saves you time. Um, and you could just search using this control vocabulary. I'll show you how to find it and how to use it. Um, but if you're gonna do a sophisticated um, search, a more involved search, I would say you want to use a mix of control vocabulary and keywords. Um, and there's a reason for that. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, so sometimes there aren't controlled vocabulary. Sometimes there is no mesh for your term. Um, when everything started to hit with COVID, there was no controlled vocabulary. There was no mesh for COVID um, because there weren't enough articles at the beginning to warrant um, a mesh term and mesh only gets added into Medline once a year. Um, now this was a special occasion or a special circumstance where Medline was like whoa we need a mesh term for this and so now there is a mesh term for COVID-19. Um, uh, they added it uh, pretty quickly on but in most cases um, it takes year to years for mesh to get added with new concepts. So if we only search with that mesh, we're missing out on articles that haven't been tagged. Um, a lot of the technology terms like augmented re reality, um, text messaging, smartphones, it's taken a while for those to become official mesh terms. Um, and then the other thing is, it takes a while for those indexers who work for Medline to actually index articles. Um, sometimes it can take up to six months. And we as researchers want that new current um, research. So if we're only using mesh, we're going to miss out on those new articles that are coming out that haven't been indexed. And so what we typically do is we'll stick with that mesh 
and then we'll add in some keywords just to make sure we haven't missed out on the new articles and the articles that um, haven't been the, on the new articles. And then um, especially if we're searching a concept that doesn't have a mesh term. Okay, so let me show you how that works. And if you remember our question, backing up a little bit. Okay, if you remember our question, mobile apps being used to help those with hypertension eat more healthy diets. Um, so a question like that, we're going to pull out the search terms and we're going to search one term at a time. So we're going to search mobile apps. We're going to search hypertension. And then we're going to search diets. And what we're doing is called a building block approach. We're going to search each concept separately and then we're going to combine them all together. So think of, um, I always think of Lego blocks. And I think of building um, some kind of Lego block tower with my search terms. I don't know if that helps or not, but let's start with our first block here. Um, so we have mobile applications. And I'll show you a couple ways to find, oh, I gotta clear all those limits I added in there. Okay. We were looking for mobile apps, hypertension and diet. So let me show you a couple ways to find the mesh. We've just said how wonderful mesh is. Um, it starts out with, there we go. Okay, it starts out with finding the mesh that would be useful if we can get into an article. We can scroll down in that article and all of the mesh terms that are tagged to it are right here. We can look at those. So remember that indexer, reading every article, tagging um, them with the appropriate terms. Those all live down here. Um, and let's see. I see one right here, mobile applications. Uh, looks like a mesh that I want to use. If you see a star at the end, um, that star says that this is a major concept of the article. So our article is focusing on diet therapy, it's focusing on mobile applications, and it's focusing on um, salt, dietary salt. If we wanna go and look further at this mesh term, I'm gonna click on it, and I can go into the mesh database. It's a whole separate database just for mesh. Okay. It looks a lot like PubMed, right? I really wish they would make the mesh database like uh, bright green or something completely different so you know you're in a new database. But just believe me, you are. Um, if you ever get confused, it says mesh and it says mesh right there. We are in the mesh database and this is um, the record for that mesh term mobile applications. We can see a definition. And we can see the year that this became an official mesh term. So remember I said in January, once a year, um, new terms get added. This one was added in 2014. Um, we will miss out on any older articles, um, older than 2014, if we just use this mesh because they, are, they wouldn't be tagged to it. So again, that's why we use those keywords. Um, and then another thing to point out here, there's this long list right here called entry terms. These are not more mesh. These are the terms that if an author uses any of these terms, their article is going to get tagged with mobile applications. So this is a great place to go to look for additional um, synonyms or keywords that we can add to our search. And we'll get back to that later. But if I like this mesh term and I want to use it, I'm going to add it to my search builder. Let's make that a little bigger. Notice here, I clicked on add to search builder. Notice that it's put it in quotes and then it's used bracket M-E-S-H mesh, close bracket. So this is the exact syntax that PubMed needs to know that we're looking for the mesh. If I wanted to, I could search it in PubMed and I will just get articles tagged with this mesh. 
Um, but as I just said, we're going to do we're going to do a mixed search where we have control vocabulary and keywords. So what are some other ways that we can say mobile applications? I'm going to do or mobile applications. You can just type in the search box. What are some other synonyms that we could use here? We want to make sure we're not missing out on articles. So it's, it's good to think of a few. Give you guys a minute to think. What are some other words for mobile applications? Okay, we got mobile apps. Phone apps, cool, I like it. Uh, I see a lot of times M Health. Okay, I won't push it. Um, digit, ooh, I like digital app. That's a good one. Okay, now um, plural or singular, we can do for any of these terms, right? Now, what I used to be able to do in PubMed, this mobile applications, I used to be able to go down APP and put an asterisk at the end of that. And what that does is truncate. So that's called truncation. And this would pick up app, apps, application, applications, any of those variations that come after the P. But the new PubMed has made my life a little bit harder. It has made your life a little bit harder because it, the new ruling is you have to have four letters to truncate. You can't just do APP, it, it won't work. You would need one more letter here. So what that means is we have to do, we can do application with an asterisk and that will get our singular or plural or mobile apps or mobile app. It's kind of frustrating. Um, and I'm also gonna add those quotes around my phrases. So you can see in this box here, I can build my search as I go. Uh, mobile applications, I have the mesh, and then I have those, and then let's get, um, did I lose them? Let's get these terms that other people suggested. Phone apps, we can truncate that to get plural and singular. I'm not gonna put quotes around mHealth because that's a single word. It doesn't need quotes, only uh, multiple words. Digital apps, okay. Double check to make sure there's no spelling, that there's quotes on both sides of your search. Um, yeah, so uh, Noelle, unfortunately, because it's only three words, or three letters, I can't truncate it. I used to be able to. Okay. Yeah, drives me crazy. Okay, uh, make sure everything's good, and then I'm just gonna search that in PubMed. And that's our first building block. 44,000 articles, don't freak out when you see that. It's okay, um, because we have two more blocks to go. Uh, so I showed you one way to get some mesh. You look at the article, see what mesh they're tagged with. Uh, another way is to go into the homepage. This is the PubMed homepage. Scroll down and there's the mesh database. So I'm gonna click on that. And I'm back in mesh database land. And again, it says mesh, it says mesh, it says mesh. So uh, still it's you know completely confusing that you're in a different database. Uh, at least for me it is, maybe not for you all. Okay, let's do the next one, hypertension. Okay. Now what the database is doing is it's trying to show you the mesh that you might want. It's gonna show you all the ones out here that it thinks are relevant. And you can see there are a lot of different kinds of hypertension that it's pointing me to. And then it's gonna go from there. I'm just gonna click on this first one, the general generic hypertension. And again, I can look at this definition, make sure it looks good to me. There's no date here, um, and I think that's because this is probably a pretty old mesh term. Um, it's been there long enough that it doesn't 
need to add a date, um, you're not gonna miss out on articles when you use it. Uh, a couple other things to point out, if we scroll down, remember here's our entry terms. But here, underneath hypertension, is all of the more specific mesh. And here's the broader ones, cardiovascular diseases, broader, right? These are all of the more specific forms of hypertension. And their articles that are tagged with these mesh are automatically included whenever you search for hypertension. If you really don't want these narrower terms, uh, white coat hypertension, you don't want those, you can go up and you can click on do not include mesh terms found below this term in the mesh hierarchy. Um, the technical term for what it's doing is called exploding. And when you click this button, you're telling it not to explode. So if you don't want those narrower terms, click do not include, go up here, add it to your search builder, and you'll see the syntax now says no EXP, no explode. Okay, um, if we don't want that, if we really do just want to search it with everything, which is what I usually do, leave it alone, make sure it says mesh. Okay, and then we can add our other terms. Hypertent, I'm gonna stop it at the I, um, get hypertensive, hypertension, any variations. And I'm gonna do high blood pressure. Again, I'm gonna use that asterisk to get single or plural. And notice that I put quotes. Okay, again, we could keep going. We could add more um, keywords if we wanted to. But I'm just putting in a few so you get an idea of what it looks like. Double check spelling, make sure that your truncation looks good. Um, nope, I did misspell, didn't I? Pressure, there we go. Okay, and then we're gonna send it to PubMed. Okay, again, tons of articles on hypertension. That is not a surprise, um, but it shows us that our search is working. We're gonna do the last one. So again, this uh, might feel a little, I don't know, cumbersome, but the more you use this approach, the easier it gets, I promise. Okay, diet. We could use diet if we wanted. Let's see if there's anything else. There's all kinds of diets. If we want to focus on a specific one. Um, but there is a term that I see, yeah, diet therapy. Let's do that one. I think that's gonna be a little more appropriate for what we're looking at. Um, I will mention there are all of these subheadings over here. Do you see those? So I can be more specific about my term. I can say I really want diet therapy. Um, well, that's kind of silly. It's redundant, but as a, a therapeutic use of diet therapy, um, or I could look at the um, economic impact of diet therapy. Uh, what else? Uh, pharmacology, if there were um, specific medications we want to look at. You can check those and it will narrow your search a little bit. I generally don't use them because um, I want to have control. I don't want to miss out on articles because they weren't indexed in that way with that very specific subheading. But they're here and I wanted to mention them just so you're not like, what the heck are all of these? But usually I leave it alone. I just take that mesh and add it to my search builder. And then again, we can do diet. Nutrition. Yeah, I was just thinking if there was a better way to truncate that. Oh gosh, I don't know if I added field tags to my other two. Well, that's okay. We can edit that um, in a minute. Okay, does this approach make sense to everybody? Um, as I said, it's very uh, tedious, but it's gonna be super effective, um, I promise you, okay. I'm seeing some yeses, good, you're, you're still following me. Okay, search in PubMed. Okay, we have our three building blocks and now we're gonna stack them together, we're gonna combine them and um, we do that in this advanced search. 
So you go to advanced, you scroll down, and you'll see those blocks. So I've been searching for a while, so the numbers are not one, two, three, but um, the blocks that we care about are 16, 17, and 18. And we're gonna combine them. Um, and I do, I think I can go in here. I thought I could edit it. Perhaps not in here. Okay, well, I wanted to add field tags to everything, but I was busy talking and I forgot. I think it will be okay. We'll survive. So to combine these three blocks, there's a couple things you could do. I could just type in number 16 and number 17 and number 18. So 16, 17, 18, I'm saying and because I want the articles to talk about all three of my concepts. Or you can go in here and you can click on these three dots. You can say add to query. I can add the next one with an and, and the next one with an and. Notice it's adding the parentheses, it's grouping it all for you, so you don't have to think about that. And then when we're ready, we hit search. I'm sorry, I'm being really meticulous here. I want to add my uh, field tags. Bear with me. If you're doing a more comprehensive search or a systematic review, you probably won't do the TI field tag. You're gonna miss out on articles. Um, but you can do TIAB. And there's one more that people often use, and that's TW, which is a little bit broader than TIAB. It includes author text words. Um, and it includes a couple other things. Um, I mostly use the TIAB. I find it to be just as effective, but you can test it out. So instead of TIAB, it would be TW. Those are your two options when you're doing a literature review. Okay, and then we go to search. And this is where you cross your fingers because you're hoping there's articles out there with our three building blocks, 41 articles. Okay, good. And we can scroll through and we can look at them. So that is the systematic approach, the more sophisticated way to do a search. Um, and that is in the advanced search. And after you run each of them, you combine them and you do your search. Now, a couple other things to help you. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so let me be quick about this. If I go into an article, there are similar articles now. So you can go in there and look at those and see if any of those are helpful for you. And they also have included the cited by. So who has cited your article, and I think who your article is citing. You can see both of those now in the new Pub PubMed, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and that's a great way to find more articles. The other thing to point out, if you wanna access this article, you've done all the searching, you're ready to access it, Look for these buttons here. This find it at JH is the libraries button. If you click that, it's gonna go through all the journals we subscribe to. These are all the ways that you could get your hands on that article. Um, if this doesn't show up, you might see a link that says order through interlibrary loan. So if the article's not available online, you can order it through interlibrary loan. It usually takes about a week or two for it to come and it will come in your email. So you can get the article. Um, there's really very few situations where you wouldn't be able to get an article. The other nice thing that PubMed's added is the site. So it will show you how to cite it. It's doing it in AMA, but you can change your style. Um, what else? You can save it, you can email it, you can send it. Those are all new. Um, so those are the things you can do if you like the search a whole lot and you want to save it or create an alert, perhaps you want to know if there's any new articles that come out on it, you're going to create an alert and it's going to ask you to log into your MyNCBI account. So let me point out where that lives. Right here where it says login, this is an account um, that you'll want to set up. I would say do it today while it's fresh in your mind. Um, you're going to create that account. 
You can do it through um, Hopkins. There's a couple ways to do it. Um, yeah, you can do it through your school. And that way you would just use your Jet ID to log in. I have a separate account and I do that because, uh, God forbid, if I'm ever not at Hopkins, I want to still be able to access everything. And um, so let me make this a little bit smaller. Just log into my account. Okay, so let's get back to PubMed. I'm now logged in, you can see my name. Um, and what I want to show you is how you can create those alerts. And I know that um, somebody had asked me ahead of time, how do I create an alert for um, journals? So if we were being more specific, I, I did this um, for the person who emailed me. Uh, he had uh, mentioned a couple journals. So you can, um, in here, let's say that you want the journal Nature. You want to get alerts on the journal Nature. You're going to pull down that arrow. We're going to type in Nature. Okay, we can add it, or we could add another journal. Let's say we also want Cell. We're going to say Or. Nature or cell, either one is good. We could even do New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. Okay. So we want these three journals. I'm just running it so we can see these are articles published in those journals. And now I can add my topics. So uh, the person who emailed me was interested in neuroscience. We can do the fancy things that I just talked about, like the field tags. Um, I did truncate neuron to get neuron or neurons. Um, we're gonna add that. And then we're gonna combine those with and. Okay, so I've now said my topic in these journals. Search it. Okay. A lot of results, but what we're trying to do is set up an alert. We want the new stuff that comes out after these results. So I'm going to go to create an alert. And again, you have to be logged into your account to do this. I'm going to create an alert. Name it something that makes sense to you. So you can say like my topic alert. I don't know. Name it something better than that. It will keep track of your search terms. And then you're going to say, yes, I want an email update. Make sure it's the right email. You can have it weekly. I usually do it weekly, like on Fridays. I want to see it. Okay. Um, you can tell it if you want summary or abstract. Let's do the abstract. And then how many you want to see. So if you want to see all of the new ones, you know, set it to 200. Um, and then save it. And it will automatically, weekly, on Sundays, send me any new articles. The first batch might be everything, it might be gigantic, but then after that, each week, it will be the newest things. So you can do that um, to do uh, an alert, or if you just really like the search that you were doing, so if we wanna go back to our, um, oh, I guess when I logged in, I lost everything, oh no. Anyway, if you just wanted to do a search and save it, <clears throat> Let's get to this gigantic search here. Um, you can save your citations or you can create an alert and just tell them not to email it. You don't want it to email it. You just want to save it and go through everything. And then you can retrieve it at any point by going into your account. So you can see these are all the saved searches I have. I can get into them at any point, um, I can rerun them, I can look into them, I can change it to an email alert. And then the other thing I've done with my citations is I've set up collections. So if I run the search and I like my results, I can choose some of these. And I can email, I can send to a collection. You're gonna name the collection. 
sorry, create new collection, name it. And then the nice thing is when you create that collection, you can share it with other people. So if I make it public, I'll get a link and I can send that to other people. So a lot of times when um, uh, people email me and ask for help, I'll run a search for them. I'll get them that link and I'll send them that link. So that way they can look at those articles in the collection that I have found. Um, so those are the things I wanted to point out, uh, this creating an alert or saving your search and the collection. Um, last thing to point out is if you are using a citation manager, and we do have classes on how to use RefWorks and EndNote, so if you'd like to um, get up to speed on that, they'll show you this again, but when you have your citations and you wanna send them to RefWorks, you click on Citation Manager, you're gonna create a file, and then it will save it down on your computer, and you can upload it into RefWorks or upload it into EndNote. Um, so pretty easy. I think that's everything I wanted to show you. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything. Oh, there is a user guide. And it's pretty handy. Um, in fact, there is in there, you can learn more about Mesh, but there are all the field tags. So I went into that user guide and I looked into appendices. Here's a list of all the field tags that you can be using. Um, this author one, if you know a specific author and you want to see everything they've published, is pretty helpful. So bracket AU, close bracket. Um, we were using the TIAB and TI and TW. Those are all there. But I just wanted you to know there's a whole bunch more field tags that are possible. And then the last thing I want to point out is we have a YouTube channel. Unfortunately, it's not linked to our website. You have to Google YouTube Welch Medical Library. But in it, um, we have our classes that we're teaching, but we have a whole series of Pub, PubMed videos um, that you can watch. And they cover a lot of what I cover today, but they go way more into depth. It's a whole series of PubMed videos, um, about an hour to watch, and by the end of it, um, you should be given some kind of PubMed degree um, or award or something because you will be a pro um, if you make it through these and you're able to use the strategies that they talk about. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to cover. Um, does anyone have any questions for me? Oh, that's a good question. If I don't use TIAB, what is it doing? Um, if I don't use TIAB, it's doing something called all fields. It is searching for that term everywhere it appears in the title, the authors, the journal, the abstract, the author supplied keywords, um, and it goes on from there. And the reasons it can be frustrating is that it might find an author who is named cancer, JL cancer, that's coming up. It may be the journal, Indian J cancer, um, even if that's not what you're trying to get at. So again, when you just search the term, you are being very, very broad. Um, so yeah. Is there a good place to review Boolean search terms? Um, yes, if you go back to that YouTube channel, um, the, the video that you want to watch is called PubMed Basics. And that will go through everything you ever want to know about Boolean search terms. But really, the two terms that um, are valuable to know about, oh, where am I? There we go. Basics of searching. That's the video for you. Um, but really, the two Boolean terms that um, you're going to want to use are and and or. And we use them both today. The and is if you want those, art those terms to be in your article. So if we do cats and dogs, both those words have to be in the article to show up. Or is saying this term or that term. So cats or dogs, you're gonna get a bigger set of articles. Some will talk about cats, some will talk about dogs. Um, any other questions? Let me stop sharing.
Okay, well, thank you all for uh, coming to this session.